Oke, okay. hello Mr. Dio Done. How are you? I'm good, and you? I'm fine. Oke, okay, Mr. Uh, Dio Done. Mr. Dio Done was born in 1963 in Kolt. He studied in the former Soviet Union, earning Master of Degree Russian Philology and Literature. Russian language and literature and degree of Russian France translator in 1990, 1990 from the Petris Lumumba University. Is that right? That's right, yes. And in 1996, you published a seminal biography of Russian military lead leader Abraham Petrovic Gannibal. It looks like you are uh, very famous and you have expertise in history of uh, Africa. Is it right, Mr. Diodon? Yes, I'm a historian of Africa, Africa, the African diaspora, and also the history of African relations with Russia and with the Ottoman Empire. Oh, that's great. Okay, Mr. Diodone, I would like to ask you as a historian, you came to the second multipolar congress in Russia. What was your impression? Please tell me. As a historian, let's say I had the impression of witnessing an acceleration of history. There was something like an overhaul planetary movement for the advent of a multipolar world. And hearing the 120 and more delegates of representatives of many countries, I understood all of them were asking for the full exercise of state sovereignty and for a fairer world without the threat of the hegemony of a single country of, or a single bloc. So I was pleasantly surprised to find that those who advocate the advent of a multipolar world are not seeking a, are not seeking a war against the West. They just ask the West to simply recognize that it is no longer the only dominant block in the world. Hmm. Very interesting. Mr. Diodon, how close do you know about the history of Russia and Africa? I can say that the key point of the relationships between Russia and Africa is that Russia has not been a colonial power in Africa. Hmm. At the Berlin Conference in 1884-1885, during which European powers decided on the colonial partition of Africa, Russia, which was present, chose not to participate in the colonial partition of Africa. And before that, when we study uh, the 16th, the period from the 16th to the 19th centuries, when Europe was attacking and depopulating Africa through the so-called slave trade and massive displacement of millions of African people to the Americas. At that time, Russia had its own concerns. Russia was fighting for, for its own sovereignty and its own economic and social development. But in the 18th century, what did we notice? We know the key point of the relationship between Russia and Africa is that Russia has not been a colonial power in Africa. Mm. At the Berlin Conference in 1884-1885, during which European states decided on the colonial partition of Africa, Though Russia was present, mm -hmm. Russia decided not to take part. From the 16th to the 19th century, 
when European countries were attacking and depopulating Africa through the so-called slave trade and massive displacements of millions of Africans to the Americas, Russia was busy defending its own sovereignty and fighting for a more social and economic prosperity. Mm. But what do we notice? In the 18th century, Africa appealed to Russia, but Russia had other concerns. For example, in 1751, the Ethiopian emperor Iyasu II the second, and his mother wanted to form a military alliance with Russia against the Ottoman Empire. But the Russian Empress Elizabeth Petrovna did not follow up. Some decades later, in 1787, under Catherine II the Great, Ethiopia again sought a military alliance with Russia. The Ottomans had just conquered Egypt and the Ethiopian emperor feared that his country would be invaded afterward. The Russian empress Catherine II started with her powerful minister Potemkin, a report which recommended sending instructors, Russian instructors to Ethiopia to set up artillery there and to open a cannon manuf manufacturing factory. But in August 1787, the Ottomans declared war on Russia and there was never a military alliance between Russia and Ethiopia. Mm. So it was only in the 20th century that Russia answered the call of Africa. And uh, the, it was after the Russian Revolution of 1917, then the USSR provided massive military, political, and economic support to the various national liberation movements in Africa. And now in the 21st century, even let's say before, in the early 90s, in 1990, Russia had again its own concerns and Russia stopped maintaining, developing its relations with African countries for more than 20 years, you know, since the 1990s until we can say globally 2015, but precisely 2019, because in 2019, the Russian government organized the Russia-Africa summit. So, which launched a new era in the relationships between Africa and Russia. And mm. there were two summits already. The first summit took place in Sochi. And the second su summit, Russia-Africa summit, took place in 2023 in St. Petersburg. Mm. And a lot of African head of state were present. So to summarize, we can see that before the 20th century, some African countries tried to have an alliance with Russia, but it didn't happen until the 20th century. And, but what is important is to remember that Rus Russia was not a colonial power and Russia did not take place, uh, did not participate in the transatlantic slave trade of Africans by Europeans to the Americas. Okay, next question, Mr. Dion. What were Africans' main problem in the past and what is the main problem today? Yes, in the past, I think if you allow me, I'll, I'll make 
a brief historical comment, you know, about African history, because in the world, people don't know African history. African history has been re been rewritten, you know, mm. by uh, imperialist very quick. powers. Yes, best. Okay. Make, make headline. Okay. Okay. As I mentioned, you know, it is important to know that Africa was the main and the only world superpower for thousands of years, you know, before uh, the fifth century, before our era, 2,500 years ago, Africa lost its first place as a superpower in the world, you know. Mm. Uh, it's important to remember that the, the earliest monarchy in world history was in Africa. It was Nubia, nowadays Sudan. Mm. And after Nubia, Egypt developed, you know, as you know, one of the most ancient and greatest civilizations in world history. And when Egypt lost its sovereignty around the fifth century before our era, during 2000 years, all over Africa, the north, south, west, center, except east, were developed many empires and kingdoms. But starting from the seventh century of our era, with the birth of Islam and expansion of Islam, some Arab Muslim countries from Arabia invaded the northern part of Africa. So th those regions lost their sovereignty. And from the 15th century of our era, it was the turn of European powers to come to Africa and to start, you know, the so-called slave trade. So Africa was victim of the Slavery. slave trade. Mm. There was a massive depopulation of Africa and a massive displacement of millions of Africans to the Americas. And at the 19th century, in the 19th century, after the Berlin Conference I earlier mentioned, when European powers now came to Africa to invade Africa, Africa was weak. Africa was depopulated. It is important to know that in the 16th century, Africa's population was between 600 million and 800 million people. And in the 19th century, there were only 200 million people. So Africa was weakened, was not strong enough to defend itself, and European powers easily conquered Africa and colonized Africa. So after that, there was permanent resistance, and African countries fought for the liberation and for independence. Now, till the 60s, and now from the 60s till now, African countries are still fighting for a full sovereignty for the economic prosperity. Mm. So the main problems of Africa, you know, are, you know, the, the, the struggle for the full independence, full sovereignty, mm. because Africa for the past decades was part of an unfair world you know, an, an unfair econo world economic system because Africa is rich, you know, with mineral resources, but African countries don't decide the price. They will sell the mineral resources. That's why Africa still has to fight against poverty. Mm. So this is some of the main the problems, problems, you know. Okay. Let's move to multipolar world that we are always uh, talking today. How many African yes. countries want to welcome multipolar world? Please, your comment. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that the great majority mm. of the 54 African countries, members of the African Union, are eager to enter a multipolar world. You know, the entire African continent is welcoming the advent of a multipolar world. Why? Because African people demand a fairer world economic order that respects 
the sovereignty of African states. Of course, some African states have stronger relations with the United States and the European Union, with the West in general, with Japan, etc. But other African countries are strengthening the old ties with the Russian Federation, mm. which has become with China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, the BRICS, a powerful international bloc which has been waging a fight for a multipolar world for a number of years. So the majority of African countries are for the advent of a multipolar world. And we mm. can see that there were uh, more than 30 African countries, uh, more than 40 African, I think there were 49 African delegations which participated to the second multipolar world forum. Mm. Okay, Mr. Dion, uh, please tell me from your calculation how many uh, African countries on the track to multipolar world now? For your calculation, 10? Uh, for my calculation? Yes. Five, we, have two, we have two dynamics in Africa. Mm. We have now the population, the people, you know, they are organizing massive demonstrations, you know, in the countries, asking for the, the governments to be part of these new dynamics, to be part of this new multipolar world. And in this, taking this into account, I can say all the African countries are <laughs> in that dynamics. Now, if we take the government, mm -hmm. if we take the government, for the moment, I think we are more than 30 countries. 30, 30 countries. countries. Oh. Yes. It's good yes. news. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, Mr. Dioden, it's very sad to hear uh, your background, your uh, African country's background. We know that very, very uh, suffering, misery. And uh, so, of course, we have a solidarity as a ASEAN. ASEAN and Africa, I think, have a similar background, yeah, colonialism, imperialism, until now. So that's why we want to uh, break through, yeah, to build a new, yeah, to build new spirit, uh, in under the banner of a multipolar world. My last question: What is your message to the African community and to the world, especially for maybe to United States or Europe? Uh, West Europe and NATO, because I think it is uh, still yeah still a burden of your uh, your countries. What is your message? Yes. My message is that Africa, what people, what all observers see today, all those movements in Africa, you know, for sovereignty, etc. It's not a war against the West. It's not a war against, you know, the United States, European Union, etc. Mm. The question is that African people have been, you know, uh, our countries were having very good ties, you know, with all those countries, all those Western countries. If you take since Africa became independent, you know, in the 1960s. But the, 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 the fact is that people don't see any, any, any prosperity in Africa, you mm. know? So, so African countries just want now to live in a multipolar world because they consider that in a multipolar world, they have uh, new partners, you know? Mm. It's not only Russia, there, are, there is Turkey, there is Iran, there is Brazil, there is India, you know, uh, even Singapore, you know, Malaysia, Vietnam, and... Uh, Indonesia, uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> yes, Russia, of course. Yes, of course, Russia. And but, uh, Indonesia, you know, my country is Indonesia. <laughs> you, you don't know Indonesia, that. yes, but, you know, <laughs> Af African people remember also Indonesia, you know, because yes. we remember the Bandung Conference, because the non-aligned movement, you know, Mm. Uh, is not dead. 
Yes. Even now, in these dynamics for a multipolar world, many African countries are talking about the non-alignment, you know, movement and history. Mm. So, yes, Indonesia, of course, uh, remains is a, a, an, an ancient partner, you know, a partner of Africa. So, uh, yes, to the West, what Africa wants is that the West should change its method. Mm. The West should stop seeing Africa just as a place where they can take mineral resources. You see? So mm -hmm. African people want true partnerships with everyone, with all countries of the world, including with Western countries. So, you know, in some countries, people say now we don't want the West, but it's not they don't want any relations with Western countries. It's that they don't want the perpetuation or continuation of the old imperialist, colonialist Western practices. Mm. So as soon as the West can change its method, it will be welcome everywhere in Africa. Mm. But the other thing is that the Western countries cannot dictate to African countries who should be their friend. You know, that's another problem. Some governments recede, uh, were threatened to sanctions if they decide to, 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 to have some alliance with Russia of, you know, of BRICS countries. Why? Western countries themselves entertain good relationships with BRICS countries. They didn't stop the economic relations with China, with India, with Brazil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So mm. why do they want African countries to stop and not have strong economic mm. and even in political, even military relationship with other countries? Mm. Because we heard that Africa is facing, you know, some security problems. And African governments ask the Western partners to supply necessary weapons to fight against terrorists. But that wasn't the case in many countries. That's why some African government decided to turn to Russia to Turkey, to Iran, to China, to India, for new military alliances, you know? So mm. Africa is not against any other country. Africa just wants to live in peace, in security. And Africa is welcoming all partners in the world who are ready to help Africans to live in peace and to fight against all those problems of insecurity and poverty. Okay, uh, once more, Mr. Dion. Uh, we know that our first president, Sukarno, yeah, one of the pioneers to promote non-alignment movement, we say about emergent, emergent force, a new emergent force, uh, meaning that not in the Western and the Eastern block at that time so as historian uh how do you know about uh, our first president and how the africans appreciate to this kind of idea do you still find maybe uh the history of uh bandung conference and the speak maybe writing of uh, sukarno in your literature in your literature Please. Yes, some a few years ago, uh, when uh, it was the 50th anniversary of the Bandu Conference, in many African countries, some scholars, not only historians and but mm. political scientists, mm. and some maybe elder political leaders. Yes, they uh, still talking. Yeah, talks, they still talking about. Yes, they're so, still talking about, yes, they're still talking about, because, you know, in the new international political situation, still relevant. When, 
Yes, because yes, because you know, uh, when people heard in Africa that there was a new law mm. uh, passed in the U.S. Senate that they will sanction any African country will have, you know, relations with Russia. When when the information was given by the media, people said, and this was even one year or two years ago, people said in many African countries that. Mm. Africa was uh, a strong member of the non-aligned movement for decades. Mm. And even during the East and West, you know, uh, Cold War era, yes, many African countries were non-aligned countries because that ideology, which was uh, developed by Indonesian President Sokarno, who organized the Bandung Conference, Mm. had a great influence in Africa, you know, African mm. political leaders in the 50s, in the 60s, like Kwame Nkrumah, the Ghana, the president of Ghana, who wanted to create a real African union, you know, and uh, uh, other leaders were killed, like Patrice Lumumba, you know, uh, Amilcar Cabral, etc. Uh, uh, many African leaders who fought for the African independence when African country, when the countries became independent, independent, they entered the non-aligned movement. Mm. And it's true that after some decades, you know, we had in Africa what we call the, the organization of African unity. And at the time, the, the OAU decided that until there will be a single African country under colonial rule, Africa will fight against for the independence and sovereignty of that country. So when South Africa was liberated and the African national movement of Nelson Mandela took the power, you know, after that, you know, uh, the liberation struggle movement, you know, declined. And, and people stopped talking, you know, about, uh, you know, nationalism and about the non-aligned movement, et cetera, et cetera. And Africa moved and it was, it coincided with the end, you know, of the Cold War, mm. you know? Yes. But now with the pressure, the Western countries are doing on African countries, telling them, telling, telling them that there should be a line only towards, you know, the West. Many African political scientists and uh, political leaders are remembering the yes. non-aligned movement and are yes. talking about it and say, we have the right to be non-aligned. Mm. And having good relationship with Russia does not mean that we want to stop our relationships with the West. Mm. So, and that was a one of the main principles of the non-aligned movement. Yes. We, you know, African countries, Asian countries have their own problems. And they are, they are not in the dynamic to say that to solve their problems, only, you know, Russia or China or India can help solve the problems. Mm. So we we not, you know, we, we're not saying that because we know that in the Western countries, there are also different ideologies. There are different, you know, uh, political movements also. So, and we know that um, with the, uh, some political leaders can take power in the Western countries and change radically, you know, mm. the, the, uh, and stop with the imperialist and neo-colonial, you know, policy those countries are still you know having mm. okay mr so, dear i i get your point that uh very yeah. wise statement that uh you are interested and maybe active in multipolar world movement doesn't indicate that uh african country must cut off tie with the western ally no it is good uh, and wise statement. And 
why I ask about the uh, non alignment movement because I want to make connection between uh, non alignment movement and the idea of multipolar words. It doesn't mean that non alignment movement is just in the history. We want to revive and to connect with the multipolar world, of course. Also, to strengthen multipolar world, we have to strengthen non-alignment movement and also uh, bridge uh, movement. So bridge movement and multipolar world and non-alignment is not like the enemy of the Western ally, but we just want to adjust this, want to equal, want to respect as human being. I think that's my close statement to close our discussion, Mr. Diodont. I hope you will discuss with me in another subject. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, interview. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.